Hey everybody, Saul here. I have only one rule here. If it's animated, I'll comment on it. And you'll have to forgive me. Not feeling so hot right now. So if it's alright with you, I'm just gonna sit here and do the review instead of getting up and going to my normal chair. Just don't really feel like moving right now. I mean, we went through so much crazy zany action in the Animaniacs month that I think we need a breather, a nice calm diversion just to get us back on track after all that craziness. So, feel free to unfasten your seatbelts and sink yourself deeper into that butt groove on your couch because we're gonna take a look at Anomalisa. Woo! Anomalisa is a stop-motion adult animated film produced by Hanway Films, Starburns Industry, and Snoot Films, and is adapted from a 2005 play of the same name written by Charlie Kaufman, who rewrote the play into movie format. The film received its initial funding through Kickstarter, with crowdfunders raising over $400,000 for the production, and as a result, the runtime was increased from 40 minutes to feature length. The movie was distributed by Paramount, released in theaters in December 2015, and later received several award nominations, including an Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, becoming the first R-rated movie to be nominated in that category. However, it lost out to Pixar's Inside Out. Ugh. Seems like all I do is review the losers to that goddamn award. Well, this is a gathering spot for losers, everyone! So without further ado, let's take a look at Anomalisa. Ah yes, a plot. How I've missed thee. Not to say the past month hasn't had plot, oh no, but in all seriousness, I've had nothing but backstory to elaborate on for weeks now. So, here it goes. Hope I'm not too rusty. Michael Stone is a world-weary, bored, and lonely customer service expert who travels to Cincinnati on a business trip for one day. While staying at a hotel, he meets an intriguing, insecure woman named Lisa, and is instantly enamored with her. Uh, hmm, it's a bit succinct, no? Well, I guess there is one major thing I'm leaving out. Michael sees every single person around him is the exact same person, with the same voice, same eyes, same skin color, and same gender. However, Lisa, he sees as a unique being with her own face and voice, making him pursue her. Yeah, that about sums it up. While I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version, trust me when I say that there's no shortage of events in this movie. Not a single second of screen time is wasted with superfluous garbage, and it keeps itself nice and focused all throughout, something which I can definitely throw a quick applause its way. Yes, I'm always grateful when things don't waste my time. A lot like wasting six weeks of my time trapped in this room against my will. But that's another story. And speaking of another story, here are the characters. Which, okay, well, they're not stories, but they have stories. You know, this show hasn't been the same since they took all my writers and funding to make the new Super Pickle show coming out on Nickelodeon in 2019. Well, I guess I'll just have to make do with what I have, I suppose. So we have Michael Stone as the star of our film. He's a lonely, disinterested, self-loathing writer and customer service expert who lives a mundane, derealized existence where everyone around him looks, talks, and acts the exact same way. Michael feels desperately lost, searching for a reason to continue living in his bleak, commonplace world where nothing ignites a spark in his heart. Oh, I just adore characters like these! One so I can just reach in and start peeling away at their many layers like a ripe onion. The way Michael's internal struggle is depicted through his external stimuli is both clever and a very unique way of conveying emotional and mental turmoil, without having him just blurt out how he's feeling all the time. His character is finely crafted, showing us everything, from his vulnerable side, to his selfish side, to his hopeless side, and everything in between. 
And in a way, what makes me like Michael all the more is the fact that I can somewhat relate to him. Not with the whole Fregoli delusion side of it, no, just the sensation of complete and utter dissociation with one's surroundings. The feeling that one can never connect emotionally, intellectually, or spiritually with the people one associates themselves with. The knowledge that no matter how hard one tries to find meaning, depth, and happiness in their lives, sometimes it can't ever be found, and the world they once knew can never return. Whew, this is a cheery episode today, isn't it? Though some might see Michael as a bit of a self-absorbed whiner, I must admit that I personally find every facet of him extremely intriguing. Then there's Lisa Hesselman, an insecure woman who works in customer service with her best friend Emily, who came to the same hotel as Michael to hear his upcoming speech. Lisa gets roped into an intimate night with Michael after he shows his interest in her and slowly starts to open up to him over the hours. Lisa is an amazing woman, or at least her depiction is amazing. She isn't all that intelligent, or good-looking, or really much of anything at all. But that's what makes her special, and what makes her stand out from everyone else, figuratively and literally. The way she keeps herself reserved, and doesn't think she deserves anything, including praise, is portrayed extremely realistically. And when she gets a chance to open up her heart a bit and show off the real her, it's enough to drive a big, tough man, 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 man to tears, it is. Despite not being anything particularly deep or complex, Lisa has a genuine spirit and a lovely, fragile soul that merely makes all her imperfections that much more perfect. Hmm, I love seeing an animated woman that isn't appealing because of her big ol' ample bosom, or her spanking great ass, or her... Hmm. Well, when you think about it, that's kind of the only reason women are in anything. So I like her. I like her a lot. And speaking of things I like, let's tear open the good things! Now let's begin where I always begin in a stop-motion production, the visual style. Unlike the traditional clay, plastic, or ceramic models normally used in stop motion, this movie uses 3D printed figures and a soft, fabric-looking style that really accentuates the tone and atmosphere of the film in general. They're just human-looking enough to sometimes forget you're watching an animated movie, but they look just animated enough to not topple over into the uncanny valley. It's a situation where this movie didn't even need to be animated in the first place, but the creators did anyway, and I'll give them another quick applause for that. And even though they didn't have to make this an animated production, they show such overwhelming respect, care, and attitude towards the medium that I just want to tip them all the hats. Regarding the technical aspects of this movie though, my god is it incredible at times. It doesn't look incredible, mind you, but the camera work is exquisite, the lighting is absolutely perfect, and the facial expressions are all perfectly timed and so unbelievably expressive at times that, if it weren't for that weird line going through the middle of everyone's faces, I could swear the models were motion captured. The way this movie presents its story in such a way that's completely bereft of any of the traditional trash, like unnecessary action scenes, explosions amundo, stonking gray tits, or forced cheap romance, just endears it to me all the more. It's a completely no-frills, simple, self-contained narrative that encompasses the sheer breadth of its existence 100% internally. In the most basic terms I can say, this movie is pure. It's a story the creators actually wanted to tell instead of being contractually obligated to like so much of the horrid crap that gets churned out of Hollywood every day. And I can see they put every last inch of their hearts, minds, bodies, and souls into it. And for that, I think they deserve a much larger, longer applause. But now we come down to the most surprising praise I think I've ever given. This movie has one hell of a good sex scene. Now, I'm gonna have to censor most of it because YouTube is a giant stodgy old nanny who refuses to admit vaginas are a thing. But yes, I have to say that this film has one mighty fine depiction of sex. Normally, I'm very uncomfortable talking about this sort of thing, since I have the same sexual recognition abilities as your average potato. But I must admit, this one catches my eye. Not just the sex part, but because of how tastefully done it is. It doesn't rush itself, it takes its time to build the mood, and the sole purpose isn't just to ignite the mid-movie wanking session, it's to show the beautiful, but somewhat awkward melding of two souls, in hopes that they can mend the wounds they have and find some semblance of a connection. Uh, not to say you couldn't have a good wank here, but you'd have to deal with the overwhelming shame afterwards. Nah, just kidding. There's no need to be ashamed, my wanking viewers. You're always welcome here, and there's plenty of tissues to go around. So, given that I've thoroughly licked this movie's asshole inside out, you'd probably assume I have nothing bad to say about it, right? Well, no! You shouldn't assume things, because you know what they say. 
To assume is to make a complete frothing idiot of oneself in the eyes of others. But yeah, I do have one moderate issue with this film. While I commend the pace the movie takes, that doesn't mean it doesn't drag a little bit at times, especially in the first 15 minutes. Though I understand it's establishing the mood and scenario overall, it just feels a little bit plodding to me. We see literally everything Michael does, and it actually reminds me a little of the first 15 minutes of Plumbers Don't Wear Ties for the 3DO, only about 17 zettabytes less stupid. Though this may not be an issue for some people, I just found it to be a wee bit slow at times. Still though, I can think of plenty of worse things it could do. Anomalisa is a brilliant amalgamation of story, character, animation, style, and tone that blends into one fantastic smoothie of enjoyment. Those who aren't fans of slow, depressing character studies most likely won't find a shred of entertainment here. But for those people like me who do, there's plenty to love about this loveless entity. If it weren't for some pacing problems and an overall slow opening, I'd give this anomalous little passion piece a perfect pass. I give Anomalisa... So, Anomalisa. Is it watchable? That's a big ol' yes indeed. Especially if you're a fan of stop motion like I am, you'll find plenty to watch here. Is it enjoyable? Uh, barring the slow nature of the first 15 minutes or so, I put a big hulking yes stamp on that. Is it memorable? I would say that once you watch it, it's definitely gonna stick around in your mind for a long time, but in terms of the general human consciousness, I don't really think so. People don't like to be challenged. They don't like to think. They just like to see the same ridiculous garbage they've seen over and over and over again. And to be honest, I'm kind of sick of it. I'm sick of it all. I'm sick of it all. Sick of it all. Sick of waiting. I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of waiting. I'm sick of everything. I'm sick of this room. I'm sick of being trapped in here. I'm sick of it. I need to get out. I need to get out. I'm sick of this. Sick of everything. I have to get out of here. I have to get out of here. Six and a half weeks. It lasted longer than I thought. I think you and I need to have a chat. Want to stay up to date with all the latest Eye of Saul news? You can follow me on Twitter as well as on Facebook at twitter.com slash eyeofsaul299 and facebook.com slash eyeofsaul. I update them every day, so if you want to check out news on the show as well as updates, just follow the links here. Towers in bed, I'll try to reconstruct your voice.